Hey there, fellow parents. Welcome to the Real Life of Parenting podcast, where we're all about embracing the chaos, sharing the laughter, and navigating the roller coaster ride of parenthood. I'm Jeff. And I'm Jenna. And, and together, together, we're, we're your co pilots on this adventure. adventure. Each episode, we'll dive into the highs and the lows and the hilariously unpredictable moments that make parenting the wild journey it is. So get ready for real stories, genuine conversations, and a few parenting hacks along the way. Whether you're dealing with diaper disasters or celebrating those small victories, we've got your back. So buckle up, hit play, and let's embark on this parenting odyssey together. This is The Real Life of Parenting, where every episode is a reminder that you are not alone in the beautiful chaos of raising little ones. Hello and welcome back to The Real Life of Parenting podcast. I'm Jeff. And I'm Jenna. And today we have a special guest, Corey, from the NDT podcast, Nonsense and Deep Thoughts. He also does Tales of the NICU. Anyways, how are you doing today, Corey? I am doing fantastic. You know, I woke up in a really good mood this morning, and it's probably because I knew I was going to be on a show tonight with you guys. So it's been a it's been a fun day. That's fantastic. And we're very, very, very excited to have you today. Thank you. Anyways, we'll get into the meat and potatoes in a little bit. Uh, yeah, the main reason we brought you on was we saw the story about the NICU and the journey there. And we thought it would be a great idea for for listeners who have a similar experience to listen to it. And I think that there'd be a lot for people to get out of it, essentially. How many kids do you have? Uh, so now we have three kids. And <laughs> I got to be honest, sometimes it's it's crazy to say. You know, sometimes I still tell people two kids before I catch myself. And uh, I'm like, hold on. There's three now. There's three <laughs> yeah. kids. How recent is this last one? So my most recent is uh, Mila Pearl. She was born May 23rd of last year. So she is coming up on her very first birthday. Oh. Oh, yeah. That's exciting. Is she going to get like a special cake like that or anything for a party? Yeah. So so my wife has been planning this for like two months already. Uh, she's got invitations all made up. I think she's already mailed a bunch of them out. She's got her theme. It's her very first birthday. So, yeah, we're <laughs> we're cute. very excited. I mean, the beginning of her life was a little hectic, a little crazy, a little heartbreaking for us. But uh, coming up in this first year, we said right in the beginning, we're like, we're we're doing this big for her first year. Yeah, that's yeah, that's awesome. fantastic. Yeah, it really starts coming into perspective when they get a little bit older and really thriving. You kind of forget about everything, but at the same time, you don't forget about everything. It's a weird feeling. Yeah. That is so true. You're, you're not mm-hmm. lying with that one because there, there are so many times that uh, I have to remind myself. I'm like, man, she went through a lot. Like everything seems normal right now, but she really did go through a lot in the start mm-hmm. of her life. We totally relate to that. Yeah. And um, where are you guys located? Where are you guys from? So I live in the northeast corner of Pennsylvania, uh, and you know, you guys know the Office. You ever watch the yeah. Office? Yeah, Scranton. Yeah, yeah. We're we're <laughs> really close to Scranton. Uh, we're about thirty five, forty minutes away from Scranton. So okay, that's cool. Yeah, I had a buddy who went down to Great Wolf Lodge recently from work. Yes, and he said he went through Scranton to find the Office Building. <laughs> it, I will give you guys anybody who wants to come to the area. I will give you a tip. It is not there. Thunder okay. Mifflin does not exist. But I can tell you Cooper Seafood is real. You can go there. Okay. Oh, awesome. That's great. I don't like seafood. <laughs> <laughs> I do. That's all right. Okay. See? Perfect. I'm the same way. I'm the same way. Yeah. I like seafood. My wife hates it. <laughs> and we're swapped, and he doesn't like it, and I love it. So. <laughs> yep. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> yeah. So you have two other kids. How old are those ones? So my son is my oldest. He's 13 years old now. Um, My daughter is nine. Uh, She will be 10 at the end of April. So I have two in the double digits before my youngest turns one. Wow. Wow. That's a long stretch between the kids there. (laughs) One just going into the teenage years. Yeah. That'll be a a fun time. (laughs) Yeah. It's already getting there. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I mean, we, we started to try... Uh, we've tried to have our third four years before we actually got pregnant with her. Oh, okay. So it was it was a long road. Um, mm-hmm. 
And I guess if I could, I could just say something about that part of it is mm -hmm. uh, my wife, she likes to do natural remedies for things before she has to go see a doctor and ask questions and this and that. So she researches online and sees what's worked for other people. And I just wanted to let you guys know if you're having issues with hormones or anything like that, Irish sea moss is what she started taking. And it's so she might kill me when she hears this because I'm getting a little personal, but <laughs> she was, she was having a little bit of an issue with her hormones. She wasn't regular with her periods and it would be like seven, eight months in between each one. So we knew that that was a little bit of an issue. So once she started taking this stuff, Irish sea moss, it started to regulate. And shortly after it regulated and uh, everything started to work itself out, she, she was able to get pregnant. So, I mean, for any of you women who are listening, if you are struggling with something like that, I highly suggest checking that out before heading to a doctor. Yeah, that's kind of actually interesting. I kind of had the same issue. I was never regular on mine either. And um, so they actually tested me to see if I had uh, PCOS. Um, and I ended up, I didn't. Yeah, and I mean, we, we actually had a little bit of trouble conceiving our first little one. Um, and then no, four years trouble, not though. four years. No, no, like a year and a half. Yeah. And then we ended up conceiving, but yeah, it's hard. It's tough. Well, yeah. Um, so obviously with having that kind of difficulty, was it, you guys end up feeling defeated, obviously. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it it was a weird road to go down because after this after the second child uh we had discussed it and we're like you know our our family's complete we've got a boy mm -hmm. and a girl we're good we're fine and she had talked about how you know maybe she wanted me to get the snip snip <laughs> and uh, i was like you know uh, being the typical man i am i'm like you know i don't really want to and the excuse i gave her was you know what if you want to have another one a few years down the line and sure as shit it, it happened she she got baby fever again and she decided she wanted one and um, we started trying and we didn't think much of her irregularity mm -hmm. and it was, it got to the point where we stopped expecting it. You know, she, she started to take the pills after almost four years. She started to take the Irish sea moss. She started to figure things out internally uh, and out of nowhere, you know, I wasn't expecting it at all. Right. Mm -hmm. And, she told me, she's, she yells my name from the top of the steps and I come running over. I thought something was wrong. I'm like, what, what's going on? And, you know, she's just got her hands over her face and tears in her eyes. I'm like, what's happening? I run up the steps and she showed me and she lost it. <laughs> I lost it. I was like, wow, yeah. I, I can't believe it. Cause honestly, it, it was tough because we had decided we wanted one. It wasn't happening. We kind of gave up. We're like, hey, whatever. Practice makes perfect. We'll, you know, we'll keep doing what we're doing. But, um, but yeah, it was it was awesome when wow. it finally happened. There's no harm in practicing, really. <laughs> now all your practicing is done. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really awesome. Yeah, that's, that's such a great feeling. Yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, with Mila, right? Is her name? Yes. So yeah, let's I guess jump into kind of the whole pregnancy and uh, pregnancy experience with the NICU as well. Um, what can you tell us about that? Okay, so I can I can get super detailed, which we could be here forever, um, or I can just kind of try to give you the highlights, which yep. which might be more suited to to your show and your time frame that you use. Um, but yeah, the Spark Notes is fine there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I don't—I mean, I don't know if you listened to my episode of the NICU podcast, but we went yeah. for an hour and a half, <laughs> and that was just like kind of the tip of the iceberg. But um, when she first got pregnant, that, that moment I told you about where she was super excited, I wasn't thinking about it, all that, um, we, we went to the doctors as normal, and the awkward thing about when we went to this, it was a new doctor because she, her old doctor was no longer at the practice she was at, so we went somewhere closer. And they wanted to do a pap smear, which we thought was weird because she wasn't due for one. And uh, a few days after that, she ended up miscarrying. So that was that was a new experience. That was her first miscarriage. And you hear that people go through this quite often anymore, it seems. And 
you don't really think about it until it hits home. Uh, we struggled a lot with that. So like I told you guys, we were at the point of feeling defeated and, and weren't really expecting anything anymore. So then when that happened, our hopes were kind of like shot. We were like, all right, well, this isn't going to happen. Um, but we, you know, we talked it over and we're like, you know, we'll give it one more go. So we got pregnant again, miraculously. And uh, we ended up doing the normal pregnancy thing. This one was a lot more difficult for her. <laughs> than previous uh, pregnancies. The other two, they were super easy, uh, super predictable. She had a little bit of sickness with uh, our, I think it was our daughter gave her the sickness. And cause you know, they say they draw, the girls draw all the estrogen out of you, I guess. And um, <laughs> so this one was a little more difficult. It was a little more painstaking for her, but we got through it. Everything was, was normal. Everything was measuring right. We wanted to do the test. I think it was called the panorama. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jenna. It's the panorama test that gives you the gender. If you do, it's like a blood test. Yes. Uh, we didn't do the blood test. We just did the ultrasound for our gender. Mm -hmm. So she decided she wants to do this at 10, 10 weeks, 11 okay. weeks, whatever it happened to be. Yep. So along with finding out the gender of the baby or the sex, we ended up... Um, finding out a bunch of other things they tested like it's a whole screening that they do so at that point in time we found out that she had a 95 percent chance of having down syndrome oh yes the first trimester screening yep so yeah. that that hit a little bit and uh, i would be lying if i said i wasn't extremely scared when i first heard those results uh we we know people who who have kids with down syndrome and we know that your entire life is about to change. You know, if you had plans of having an empty nest, you, you planned on doing anything once the kids are out of the house, that's almost entirely different now. So there was that short period of time where um, it kind of, I, I guess I could say it kind of hurt a little bit, but I wasn't, I, it hurt, but I wasn't upset, if that makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. my wife and I talked about it a lot and we said, you know, there's not a chance in the world we aren't going to love this child just the same as the other two. Not a chance. And we also discussed the fact that we are going to treat her just like we treat the other two. And almost a year later, we stayed true to that. Um, but things go along. Things are measuring normal. Things are great. Um, then it comes time for, we were almost at 30 weeks. So it was like 20, 29 and five, 29 and four, something like that. She goes in for a stress test. I'm two hours away working, driving, doing deliveries and whatnot for my job. And I get a text message that says, I knew she had an appointment. I knew she was going for a stress test. They said, well, they're going to hook me up to monitors right now. And I said, Whoa, wait a minute. Do, do I need to come back? Like, what is happening right now? Because she said she was having contractions. So they wanted to hook her up. And I got very nervous, very panicked. I got a message a little while later saying, you know, everything's fine. They're just giving me a stress test. We're, we're okay. I have to come back tomorrow, though. Okay, cool. So we go back the next day. And they wanted her to see the doctor on Tuesday. So Friday and Saturday of that week, the two days in a row that she went, they ended up giving her injections for steroids. You know, the steroid injections, they said it's going to help improve the development of the lungs. Mm -hmm. So I told my boss, I was like, I need to have off on Tuesday. I need to go see the doctor. I have questions for him. Um, he's not sure she'll make it to full term. I want to talk to him. So thank God I took off because we went for that ultrasound on Tuesday, talked to the doctor. We're in there for the ultrasound and I'm watching the screen. And now at this point, she's 33 weeks. I think it's 33 weeks to the day, 33 weeks. And everything on the screen is measuring 29.5, 30, 31. And I was like, hmm, that's odd. And I started mentioning it out loud to the tech and the tech ignored me. Now, normally, if everything's good, that tech does not ignore you. They kind of tell you, oh, no, no, everything's Everything's looking great. Baby looks great. You know, I'm not supposed to tell you anything, but, you know, everything looks good. They normally do that. Yeah. So a couple minutes go by after she leaves the room. She comes back and she's like, uh, if you guys could follow me down to the doctor's office. Alarms are going off 
in my head. Every mm-hmm. time we've been to an appointment, now I, I try my best to get to every appointment. I know not all fathers can. We, we're, we're working. We can't miss it. work. We can't miss money. But I try to get to every appointment because I know, first off, she doesn't like to drive on the highways. She doesn't like to travel. Um, but, you know, I want to be there. It's been, it's been a long road. So we go down the hallway and the doctor tells us we need to get over to the hospital immediately. Uh, she said the baby stopped growing. The blood is now flowing in reverse from the baby back to the placenta. Um, I can't remember the exact term that they used for it, but so we, we were rushed over to the hospital. Uh, I had my kids with me because you know mm-hmm. they're homeschooled and we didn't have somewhere to leave them that day. So everything that the doctor was telling me and my wife, my kids heard. Cool. So being yeah. young, that probably hit them really hard. My son is an intelligent kid. He was 12 at the time. My daughter was eight and my son's intelligent. My daughter's emotional as, as is typical. When we got to the hospital, they hooked my wife up to all the wires. We're monitoring her. Um, the original plan was to send her to, uh, a bigger facility in Danville, Pennsylvania. We were in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So that's another hour away. They wanted to monitor her there. And uh, doctor comes in and says, this is what your doctor wants to do. But for the baby's best chance of survival, we want to perform a C-section right here as soon as possible. And that word alone, Mm -hmm. I think my kids hearing that was difficult because for me to hear that was difficult enough. And I looked at my kid, my son, and his face was white. Because at that time, he knew what a C-section was. He knew that meant, my. he's like, my mother has to get cut open. She has to have this baby pulled from her. So, um, I know I said I'd tell the short story. So, short story is. <laughs> That's okay. Take your time. Time. <laughs> we, we ended up uh, going in for the C-section, um, came out into recovery. Uh, an hour later, we go in to see the baby in the NICU. Uh, you know, when the baby came out, everything was fine. She was crying. I got to cut the umbilical cord. She did come out with Down syndrome. Not a problem. My wife and I were prepared. I mean, thankfully, we got that test at 10 weeks. So we were able to, yeah. you know, prepare ourselves, read some material and whatnot. Um, so we go in to see her and she had a tube coming out of her mouth and she was, it looked really foamy on her lips. And that was new to me. I was like, what is, mm-hmm. what is happening? I know she's early. Maybe this is just a thing with, you know, preemies doctor comes in, says, we need to life flight your baby to Danville now ASAP. She needs a surgery to repair her esophagus. So she was born with, bear with me here. I think I could pronounce it. Tracheoesophageal fistula. I think I got it. TEF, they call it. So what that means is her esophagus was not connected to her stomach. It formed a pocket instead of connecting yeah. down there. That so way I had to perform a certain air. We get down have. there. My wife was released from, yeah. the, um, from the hospital in less than 24 hours. We both end up going down there. And seeing the baby all hooked up in the NICU for the very first time is, it's difficult to find a word for it. I want to say sombering, um, frightening. Uh, it's a that new really experience to go through. It. It's- no, and, and there's nothing that can prepare you. Um, for the NICU, really. The little guy was three pounds, seven ounces. And my first experience was going back there, seeing him hooked up to everything. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mila was three pounds, nine ounces. Um, and sh- since she, uh, she had that TEF, uh, they couldn't even put a feeding tube in her to give her the breast milk. Mm-hmm. So all she had was a pick line. They wanted her to beef up a little bit before surgery. But with just a pick line and no mother's milk, she really couldn't. So she ended up having surgery at three days old. And, you know, when the babies are born, they end up going down in weight. So she was born at three, nine. I think she went into surgery at three, six or three, seven, something like that. Scariest day of my life. My baby's three days old. She's going into surgery. Um, so I, I believe in a higher power. I don't go to church. I believe in a higher power. I believe there is a God. And I've never been one to pray that much in my life. 
But on that day, didn't stop. Didn't stop. You know, you mm-hmm. got to have something to believe in. You got to have something to give you a little bit of faith. And it was tough. We were in the NICU waiting room, saw the doctor that performed the surgery walk by with her head down. She didn't stop at the waiting room. She must not have known we were in there. I'm looking back on it. But when I saw her walk down with her head or walk by with her head down, that shook me a little bit too. I was like, oh no, oh no. And then she made her way back to us. And before she opened the door, she smiled at us. Great. No, that's good. Yeah. I was yeah. so nervous. I, I can't tell you how scared I got when I saw her walk by. Um, everything went well with the surgery. Uh, you know, it, the surgery itself, the condition itself is still scary to me because we are getting up to a point where she's eating the, eating the purees, eating the baby food. And as mm-hmm. the teeth start coming in, she's going to be introduced to puffs and yeah. normal foods. And I'm, I'm super scared by that. So back to the, back to the NICU is, you know, she ended up spending 52 days in the NICU. My wife was down there the entire time. I was down there for the first three weeks with her. We stayed at the Ronald McDonald house. I can't say enough about that charity. It did wonders for us. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I would come down every weekend until we got out. Um, The last weekend there, you know, actually I went in on, I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday. I left work. I'm like, I'm not coming back to work until I bring my wife and baby home. Because the only thing she had to get through at that point was learning how to eat out of a bottle. They would not let her go unless she could eat. Yeah. And that was the biggest struggle. Like, while I think that the surgery was the scariest time, the recovery from that was fairly quick compared to having her learn how to eat. So we ended up coming home after 52 days. And it's it's been an adventure since. Yeah. So with her um, learning how to eat like she would have had to learn how to swallow herself right yeah and then like with you know the different foods that adults eat and that they grow into did you find um that textures different textures of food have been an issue for her more so so with the baby foods so far Um, she has not had any issues with her swallowing or anything like that. She does tend to be a bit of a picky eater, but she tends to lean towards the veggies more than the fruits, which is different to me. (laughs) It's, she loves the sweet potatoes. She loves the green beans. We gave her pears the other day. She wanted nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting. You got lucky there. (laughs) Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Like. Our little guy will not touch vegetables, but whatever reason, I feel like broccoli is the hardest to get your kid to eat. But um, our daughter will eat that until the cows come home. Like, she absolutely loves broccoli for whatever reason. Um, do you, are, is there any more, like, ongoing complications with the TEF, or is it pretty much resolved? S- so as of right now, she's doing really well with it. There, there is a chance that she will need dilations throughout her life. So okay. I asked, <laughs> I asked the doctor at one of the appointments. I said, uh, "What are some things I should look out for? Is there a, a certain amount of time that will pass before we have to bring her in and have her checked? Uh, what, what, what's the deal with the TEF?" And the doctor said, "Well, basically." If she struggles to eat her food, just then then you call us and you bring her in and we'll look at it and see if it needs to be dilated. I was like, oh, my God. He's got no. <laughs> and when you say dilation, what exactly does that mean? So uh, from what I understand, her esophagus may not expand as she grows. So as she gets a little bit bigger, uh, they'll need to go in with I'm not exactly sure how it works, but I believe they take a tool, uh, they put it down into her esophagus, and it's something that just like kind of pushes the walls out to expand it a little bit. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that doesn't sound like a... pleasant. Makes me <laughs> makes me super nervous. Oh yeah, God. I'm a constant wreck when she's eating. No, I bet. 
I like I couldn't, couldn't even imagine. imagine. We were a wreck always when Liam was eating. Like with extra complications like that, that'd be something else. Yeah. The crazy thing about the TEF and being in the NICU, trying to teach her how to eat from a bottle, um, she didn't latch very well. Uh, so we we did pump and bottle feed her. We couldn't feed her normally. Like we could not yeah. give her a bottle. Like you would normally give a baby a bottle. So we kind of had to lay her on her side a little bit. We couldn't cradle her and just give it to her with her head tilted back. She had to be laying on her side. You had to hold her head and put the yeah, bottle in like, at, at a good angle. Like I, I always kind of sat her on my leg and just kept my hand under her left cheek and fed her that like, way. Watch the nipple and see how much you're putting into it. And... Yep. Yes, exactly. Yep. It's yep. very, <laughs> very, very stressful. Yeah, I know that one. You really have to pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Liam was just, uh, he would drink maybe five mils at a time, like, for the mm -hmm. first, like, few weeks of his life. Like, yeah, not even you, five. Like, yeah, you really had to make sure that, you know, he was sidling. Wasn't aspirating. He wasn't, wasn't aspirating. Wasn't aspirating. And, oh, yeah, we completely understand <laughs> um, that part of it. Yes, the stress, stress. Oh, yeah, it's... How much you have to pay attention yeah, to it. That was really, really tough. Yeah. Yeah, how so I'm interested to know how did your older kids um react um at first when you had Mila? They in the beginning they were they were very scared because it was just such a new situation. Mm -hmm. It all started the you know from the moment we found out that we had to have the C-section um I sent my kids down to the waiting room and I, I stood out in the hall to call my father. I had to get, I had to get the kids picked up. I couldn't have them there with us. I had to have someone to take care of them. So I pushed them into the waiting room and said, just, just go sit down, watch some TV. I'm going to, I'm going to call Pappy and we'll see if he can come get you guys. Walk down the hallway to make the phone call. And man, I lost it. And my son being the intelligent kid he is, he decided to watch from the doorway and I peeked over and saw him watching me. I was like, Oh God, no. <laughs> so I could see he was struggling with it. Uh, he might not show it all the time, but he loves his mother and he knew that she was about to go through some shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. He knew. So he's a good kid. He knew what was happening. He was disappointed. He was upset, but he was strong. He was a, he's a tough kid. Um, and he tried to be strong for his sister. I could see. So weeks go by and they started to struggle. They struggled hard with mom, not being home with me, not being home. They had to get past from their grandfathers, both, both sides. My older sister took care of them from time to time, would stay at our house a few days, take them back to her house. And they were just bounced around so much. Uh, I thank my family every day for being able to help me out with it. But, yeah, it was tough on them. You know, they're they're young. He might he might have been close to being a teenager, but he's still a kid. You know, and being thrown off from your regular schedule, not having your parents home, uh, man, it was wild. The day that we came home, I did not tell them that I was coming home, and <laughs> this was so funny. My older sister had them at the house. She knew we were coming. Uh. I got through the door first. They were excited to see me and they started to ask how mom and Mila were. And then my wife walked in behind me with the baby. I tell you what, man, I've never felt <laughs> so unwanted in my life. <laughs> they ran and pushed past me to their mother and their new baby sister. And I would have been hurt by it if I wasn't so thrilled by it. Yeah. You know, it was such a good moment. And they were so strong through the whole ordeal. And I'm just so proud of them for handling it the way that they did. I really am. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. It brings a smile to your face, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. How excited they'd be to meet their, well, see their little sister. Yeah. Especially mom, too. Yeah, and the crazy thing was my son was allowed into the NICU, but my daughter was too young. So when they came oh. to visit on the weekends... He was able to go in, but she wasn't. Uh, I, I will say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say the hospital's name because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. I did sneak my daughter in one night, 
to come near. And it was that's fair. Yes, it was the most <laughs> magical moment ever. Her yeah. face. It was. I didn't even care if I was going to get in trouble for it. Didn't even care. That's interesting that they wouldn't even like let her in with the with a, a parental figure. Even you know, like what was, was the cutoff? Weird. Really weird. Yeah, like I didn't even realize they would have an age limit kind of thing. Here's the thing about the NICU where we were at. Um, the hospital was great. But the NICU and all the nurses, I can't say enough about the nurses. They were all fantastic. Yeah. We became friends with a lot of them. But that NICU, it was pods instead of private rooms. So we had in each pod, there was like one, two, three, there were six, six of the, uh, the cribs or beds for the babies on this half of the room, four on that half. And then there was another room over there. So we weren't even allowed to sleep in the room with the baby. They said, you cannot sleep. You cannot fall asleep in the chair. If you need to sleep, you need to go somewhere else. You can't be here. It doesn't matter where you go, but you, you can't be in the NICU to sleep. Because there were people all over. And I guess that might be part of the reason why the kids couldn't stay if they were under 12. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. That's my best guess. That's... I was upset by it, though. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, I, I would have probably done that the exact same thing. <laughs> like, realistically. Yeah, just to get that, that moment that first glance at your new baby sister. Yeah. Well, that's definitely, definitely great that everything's going good for you now. How was, uh, how was your first like experience being at home with her? Uh, so we knew that we had to get home because we figured that she would thrive in our environment. Because you mm -hmm. guys know, being in the NICU, it's all the bells, the whistles, the people, the rushing yep. back and forth, the routine. Um, I'm sure it was the same where you guys were at, but everything, every care time was every three hours. Nine, 12, three, yeah. six. And everything was so schedule-oriented. They needed to see certain numbers with feedings and this and that. Yeah. And we were like, you know, if she's eating, she's eating, you know? Yeah. Our problem with being there was uh, the nurses, while they're amazing and did a fantastic job, they take care of three babies each. So if they go to the first baby, my baby, and she's not eating right away, she's not ready for it, they hook her right up to the feeding tube. I wasn't about that. Because how is she going to learn? Yeah. So we got home and it was, it was like magic. It was like magic. It was so nice to be home. Uh, my wife was thrilled. My kids were thrilled. We were able to get back into a normal routine and just be together as a family. I think mm -hmm. that that was the part that meant the most to us. This was just being yeah. together. Because it was hard. I, I understand that my wife had it very difficult being away from us down in Danville in the hospital with just the baby. But man, I, I hurt too. Like being in my bed without my wife was one of the most difficult things I ever had to do. I did not sleep very well at all for those, um, I think it was like four weeks that I was home without her. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. So just yeah. being together was amazing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's super, super tough, tough when, when like your, your whole world is literally, is literally flipped, flipped upside, upside down, down when, when you, you know, you know when like when you're entering, entering the NICU yeah. and... You're having I mean, to spend an extended amount of time in the NICU. Like you, like I said earlier, you just, you're never prepared um, enough to do that. And it's just, you're, you're I, like, and also on what you were saying is not sleeping in the same bed, right? <laughs> um, so we're, we're lucky we live like 30, 40 minutes from the hospital. So we just drive back and forth every day. But one of us had to stay there and one of us had to stay at home. So we would alternate <laughs> and so we never really slept with each other or had more than an hour or two like outside of the hospital by ourselves like, yeah. it was definitely something i couldn't imagine your wife though 50 52 days you said yeah oh wow that's insane 52 days away from home <sighs> and like that like just being away from home like even yeah i can't even imagine how much of a mental toll that would have taken on your wife. And like, I know she's with the baby and that's great, but like 
just being away from her other kids and her husband. I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine. And then the, <laughs> just thinking of your other two kids there, they must have obviously went through a whole bunch and you definitely had family that, that helped out and made sure everything worked. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I, I swear to amazing. God, we, we would not have been able to manage as well as we did if a, it wasn't for the Ronald McDonald house and that yeah. is a charity I will never not donate to now. And B, if it wasn't for my family and her family stepping up and mm-hmm. doing everything that they could to help us get through that, you know, yeah. just having people close to us was a lifesaver. Is it the Ronald McDonald that they have there? Or is it, it's like some Ottawa Sanders funded one or is it a? Um, I think so. Yeah, where we are. King Toronto's got the Ronald McDonald. Yes. Yeah. By sick kids. Yeah. 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 yeah so it's i think it's important for anyone like if they're looking for somewhere to donate like that's definitely a big thing um also if you're, you're obviously experiencing NICU stuff uh those houses definitely help out a lot yes yes they do and it's yeah they're always super close to the hospital so nope so <laughs> anyways let's get into a little bit of a lighter situation here <laughs> um so how's everything going with her now Everything is going amazing with her now. Uh, we're we're past all the jitters and everything, and now it's just enjoying her, watching her grow. She's hit a growth spurt recently, so she no longer looks like a tiny little preemie. It's <laughs> wild. It's awesome. Uh, born at 33 weeks, and she's yep. she's looking like she's on par with uh, a normal kid her age. Which, uh, aside from being a preemie, she does have Down syndrome, so she's supposed to be a little bit smaller, right? Yeah. But she's she's so strong, she's so big, and she's growing so fast. Um, she's sitting up on her own now. She's eating baby foods. That's it's awesome. just awesome to watch her. It's really yeah. cool. So, I have to ask. Obviously, you've had you had a couple kids before. How was there like a big difference between having a a child with Down syndrome versus? Uh, the other two that didn't like are you noticing like any more difficulties with parenting itself or or milestones even yeah yeah milestones so so yeah so the milestones are different um yeah she's she's almost a year and she's finally sitting up trying to work with her on crawling has been a little more difficult uh Mm -hmm. she she will try she and she wants to move so bad i can tell she wants to move so badly but uh, just getting the mechanics down and all that has been has been tough. So we gear ourselves for that. We we prepare ourselves. We know that it's going to take a little bit longer to get to her certain milestones. Um, but yeah, uh, other than that, it's it's fairly normal. I apologize if you can hear my dog in the back. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Ours is snoozing. <laughs> I think my was, wife just uh, got home. Ours was drunk earlier today, so he's really uh, yeah. He's, out, he's zonked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cost us a few hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, no, that's that's great to hear that she, everything's going like she's thriving and she's great. doing great. She yeah. is. Wow. Yeah. That's quite the quite the journey. Mm. And I think like you said you said earlier that you don't care about the things. Um, I think you were talking about miscarriage earlier, but where you hear about it, but you don't really like understand it until it kind of happens to you. Um, and I think that's true with the NICU. I think a lot of people have never really experienced it or really know anyone who's experienced it. It's hard to understand what what happens in the NICU and like what happens if you are in the NICU. Like, it's tough, and you got to use every resource possible to help you through it. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, to anybody who is listening, listen to that statement. Do not be afraid to reach out and utilize every resource that your hospital provides to you. It is super helpful. Never mm-hmm. be too prideful or too nervous to ask. And did you, did you end up making lots of friends while you were in the NICU? Or? We, we made a few friends. Um, we, uh, we had two, two young girls who were near our bedside from day well not day one but uh we weren't in there too long before we started to meet them and each room that we progressed to they ended up moving with us 
my wife uh, ended up talking to the mothers of those two kids and they became pretty close and they called the girls, the little babies, they're all three were girls. They called them the girl squad. Oh, so awesome. they all still stay in touch. Uh, I believe the, at least the one is going to be able to make it to our daughter's first birthday because she was from down in that area. She's not too far away. The other one was actually from five hours away. So the other oh. one was uh, an adoptive parent. And she wow. had that baby's other two kids. She adopted the other two and got a phone call. I think it was about a week after this one was born and was asked if they wanted to adopt her. They hadn't planned for it at all. Had no idea the girl was pregnant again. And immediately said yes absolutely and came the next day oh my goodness amazing wow. people yeah. Part of gold from right there from yeah over by pittsburgh well south of pittsburgh pa so they drove five and a half hours or so to come meet this baby wow that's awesome on their part super sweet yes mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> awesome to hear that it's the, it's the connections you make i guess yeah you. yeah that's that's one thing i would definitely urge people who are just getting into the NICU or you know have the potential i i don't want to say potential that's a horrible word to use to keep in mind if you ever end up in the NICU is don't be afraid to talk to the parents around you i mm-hmm. know it's a sombering time i know it's a, a difficult time it's probably the most difficult thing you'll you'll ever go through but at the same time every other parent that's in there is in the same boat they're all going yeah. through that same difficult we, time. We and were it's nice to have some people to talk to. that was. Uh... We're both pretty introverted, and it's hard for us to uh, get in our bubble. Being, you know, in that mindset of being kind of depressed and uh, being really focused on your kid the whole time. Like we didn't. Like it was hard for me. Didn't really want to talk to anybody. I don't know about you, but for me, yeah, I'd always have that urge to talk to somebody beside me, but I would never actually do it. And, like, one day, like, the people beside us started to talk to us. And, like, basically, we just kind of hit it off from there. We still follow them on Facebook and social medias and stuff like that. And, like, um, it's just, it's nice to be able to um, relate to somebody. Because, like you said, they're all in the same boat. They're in there for a reason. Um, And, you know, it could be a very similar situation to what you're going through. Um, or it could be very different, but either way, they're in the NICU. They're going through the same experiences you are. Um, I mean, the monitors don't stop beeping. It's a big thing for us. Like we literally, even though one of us would always come home at night, like you're, you're still hearing those monitors beep constantly through your sleep. Um, yeah, it's, it is a very tough place to be. <laughs> were you a, were you a monitor watcher too? Yes. <laughs> I, I obsessed over it and I really didn't want to. But it's something that you kind of end up doing. I actually had the nurse tell me, don't worry about those numbers. Don't worry about the beeping. If there's something wrong, if I start panicking, then you can panic. But yeah. until I panic, you're fine. Just <laughs> It's okay. We had, uh, like, where we were, we end up with, like, in a room where there was one nurse to three beds. And she could see everything on her screen as well as the monitor. So she's like, yes. you can just turn the monitor off. Like, Put on, on like, silent. Mode. And she goes, you won't have to worry about it. She goes, if, I, if I'm worried about it, I'll come over. Yeah, that's perfect. So we would do that, and so you wouldn't have to hear the beeping every time, like you're holding him, and it oxygen dipped down slightly, and it's just going beep, 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 beep. Yeah, I was yeah definitely one of those people that just constantly watch the watch the monitors. Like Jeff would always be like, "Stop watching the numbers. Stop watching." It was like all I see is the numbers going down, 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 and then beep, 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 and I can't stop watching. And he's like, "Well, well, we're gonna have the nurse shut it off because this is ridiculous." But it's like. You can't, you can't help but worry. I mean, and with, with Liam, it was, uh, he would always have desaturations in his blood oxygen levels. So like every time you would hold him and then all of a sudden his, his blood oxygen will go down and then we're like, okay, we need to bring this up. So we would have to readjust him into a different position so that it would come back up. And like, it was just, it was such a stressful time. <laughs> like it was brutal. So you also learn uh, medical lingo too, huh? While you're in there. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you, <laughs> you do. You learn what everything means. You, you come out feeling a little bit smarter. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. A little bit smarter until the doctor comes and talks to you and tells you what's happening. And you're like, <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. 
Can you just explain it in simple simpleton terms, yeah. <laughs> please? <laughs> Anyways, I think that's a little bit enough of the NICU story for now. Um, we have a few questions that we always like to ask everyone. Can I do the first one? You can do the first one. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. What would you do if you won the lottery? Th I'm not going to lie to you. This is one of my favorite questions. This is, this is one of my favorite questions. So I'm not a bougie person at all. I'm not a bougie person at all. So my needs are very simple. I just want a small home in the middle of nowhere, uh, a long driveway, woods around me, and a little bit of property. And I don't need a ton of cars. I, you know, a lot of people want the fancy cars. I want one nice car, 97 Toyota Supra, twin turbo, target Ooh. top. It's one of my favorites. It's my dream car. And then let my wife get hers and then get a nice family vehicle. After that, uh, I have people to take care of. You know, I've got close friends and family that I would like to, I don't know, pay off a house, pay off a car, anything I could do to help them. Like if we're talking, you know, in the U.S. tonight, we have the Mega Millions going off. It's close to a billion dollars right Ooh. now. So, makes so sense. <laughs> now <laughs> Uncle Sam takes a nice cut of that, but you're still going home with just under half a mil. Or mm -hmm. on just under half a billion, half a billion is what I mean to say. <laughs> so, good God, you couldn't spend that in the rest of your life. So, I'd put some money away in savings, let it accrue its interest. You know, you could live off of that interest if you're living simply. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't work. I would do my podcasting, you know, yeah. run that full time. And I would try to at least once a week go out and find somebody that needs help. Uh, you know, something simple. You go to a gas station, you see a woman who's struggling, seems to be by herself, might be a single mother, has an old hoopty and a couple of kids in the back. See if I can get her a new car to help her out. You know, uh, I am a big gamer. I like, I like gaming. And for a couple of years, I was streaming on Twitch. And I would love to be able to go on there and just randomly donate $1,000, $10,000 to different streamers that have little to no viewers. Just give them yeah. some kind of ray of hope mm -hmm. uh, and just, you know, find somebody every week that I can help out in some way, shape, or form. Use use the money for something good. Such a genuine, genuine, nice thing to do. Yeah. Makes us look like terrible people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, awesome. I honestly just don't need much. And I just, I don't yeah. see myself spending it all. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to have my kids and grandkids taken care of for the future. But mm -hmm. aside from that's, that, I'd love to be able to help people. You're, that's super sweet. You, know, you can get part of like your, uh, your dream there. You're in Pennsylvania. Like there's probably some nice backwoods, nice homes around or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fairly spots. close to me, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm out kind of in the country, but I still have neighbors. They're a little too close. I like my neighbors, <laughs> but I would like to be further away from them. I like I like being away from neighbors too. Yeah, me too. We're like in a in a semi, right? That's yeah. what it's called. Uh, attached. So like our neighbors are literally right there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and wouldn't it be nice to be able to walk out onto your back deck in the middle of the night and piss without worrying about somebody <laughs> watching you <laughs> piss off your back porch? You just make eye contact while you're doing it. <laughs> you get a little weird. <laughs> make eye contact with certain dominance. <laughs> yeah. But they're doing it too. Like, is it who, who goes longer? Or <laughs> It's a little cold. I mean, you don't want to like underperform. Or... Yeah, true. True. <laughs> uh... Men, honestly. <laughs> We're just Not giant children. Contest. We love to enjoy things. <laughs> <laughs> Big pissing contest. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, where, uh, where do you see yourself going in five years? Uh, so likely i'll i'll still be at my current job which i i don't hate it's not my dream job but i don't hate it uh i wake up in the morning and i go to work and i'm not anxious nervous pissed off anything like that but i hope that my podcast which i struggle calling it a podcast anymore because it's really evolved into a live talk show um but i i kind of hope 
that that grows enough to be a legitimate way for me to earn side income. Five years, I'm in five years, I'm not going to grow to be something huge. And I understand that. Yeah. But if I could expand a little bit and draw in more of a crowd and earn a couple of more sponsors, I'll be happy. I think it would be fantastic because this is something I started four years ago and it was just a hobby. Just me mm -hmm. and my buddy getting together and shooting the shit and having a good time. And now it's evolved and I have more people involved and I really enjoy it. And I think the team that I have really enjoys it. And I hope to make something of it someday. So I hope to at least advance it a little bit. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Maybe five years from now, we'll be doing the same thing. You never know. Yeah. You will be famous. Who knows? Yeah, we'll have uh, <laughs> 20 people listen to us every week. You never know, man. Just you put your time in and it can happen. Yeah. You just need, all you need is for the right person to see you. That's really all it takes. So you need that one person to see you that believes in what it is you're doing and they want to help you and it can take off from there. Well, anyways, I think that kind of wraps it up for all of our questions and talks today. And we really appreciate you coming on and yes. really going into your story there. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Absolutely. people want to hear more about the NICU story and from your wife's side in her point of view. Um, it was the Tales of the NICU podcast. Episode 10 was the one where you and your wife talked. Yep. And then you had nine other episodes on there, all varying length. Mm -hmm. uh, different people's stories, right? Yeah. So I had yeah. some people that they didn't want to speak themselves. They sent me an email and they told their story and wanted me to read it. So I did it in that form. And then I had some people that came on and told their story. And I even had one or two that wanted to go live for it. So. Wow. That's great. Yeah. That was a lot of it fun. It takes a lot of courage to tell your story, especially if it you does. don't feel like you're ready. But yeah. sometimes getting the story off your chest helps or bringing awareness essentially to different scenarios. Absolutely. So if you feel like you can't. If you want to talk about it, you can reach out. Um, anything like that. <laughs> yeah, it's well, just it's just like you guys. You guys want to let parents in general know that they're not alone in this chaotic thing called parenting. It's just the the NICU podcast I started out because I was sitting in the NICU one day and I'm like, man, I wonder if there's any podcasts about this that I can listen to, and I could not find one. Yeah. So I started it, and I'm like, I just I hope that. If it can reach one or two people and make them feel more at ease about being there and know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that's all I want. Yeah, absolutely. And what would you say? I know, like, obviously being in the NICU is very, like, a tough situation. But on a brighter side, what did you take from being in the NICU? What experiences did you take home from that? Like, positive experiences? If there were any. So the one thing that I will tell you, it's it's not particularly pertaining to being in the NICU itself inside of the hospital, but that experience, especially those first three weeks when it was just my wife and me down there in the Ronald McDonald house going back and forth to the hospital, that was the first time in a long time that her and I we're able to spend time together and just us, no kids, no people around us, no friends, no family. It was just us. So the one positive I think that came from that entire experience, aside from, of course, having our little miracle baby Mila, yeah. was that we, we were really able to reconnect. We were able to reconnect on a very intimate level. And um, honestly, I've never loved her more. Like, I, you know, mm -hmm. our relationship is so much better. Not that it was bad before, because it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But it's just, I feel like our connection is just on such a deeper level. I mean, uh, after her surgery, I was cheering her on when she finally had her first bowel movement from outside yeah, the door. I mean, can how can it. you get much deeper than that? <laughs> yeah, you got it, babe. You can do this. <laughs> and again, she'll kill me for that joke, too. But I mean, it, it honestly happened. I mean, yeah. Well, shit happens, but yeah, it, it does. Yeah. It really does. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I yeah. yeah, I feel like we got really connected and we you, did you get on the same wavelength. I think essentially, yes. and it all becomes your priority becomes that uh, your child essentially, mm -hmm. and it's just one extreme 
Yeah, and like to be honest, we didn't really talk about our experience um outside of the like once we got home, we were home. We were like, okay, let's just do this life with this child. Like, we are so glad to be home, but like the first time we really actually started talking about our experience was like just before we started the podcast. Mm -hmm. And like we were bringing up things that, you know, maybe I forgot about or maybe you forgot about. And it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. Like, oh, wow. We really went through a lot of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, uh and yeah. Nikki, PTSD is real. Yeah. Yep. For those Absolutely. who don't understand it, it is real. Uh, there are, there are times when I thought it would, it'd come out, you know, at the grocery store when you're scanning groceries or something, you hear the beeps. But for my wife, it was the helicopter because our child was life flighted oh, the night of her yeah. birth. Okay. So we were, we were down there and we were coming from the Ronnie house over to the hospital and a life flight was coming in and she lost it. Absolutely lost it. Almost went down to her knees in the middle of the parking lot. Oh so man. It, it happens. It happens to the best of us. Mm -hmm. So if you're experiencing any of that, anybody listening, you're not alone in that. That does happen. Yeah. I didn't even think about it. No, neither did I. Absolutely. We get it, like, every once in a while. Like, we have to bring them in for specialist appointments or follow-up appointments, and it's just, you just <laughs> go right back there, and you just assume the worst instantly, and it's yeah, it's hard not to, right? Um, I think that's the biggest thing for me. Yeah, me too. I have a hard time bringing Liam in for appointments, um, because, like you said, um, we just assume the worst. And there's always something like I always feel like maybe there's not, but I always feel like there is something um, a little bit more complex with him. But like, I don't know. Never, Never a dull, dull moment. moment. <laughs> Keep it on your toes. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, I think that's going to do it for us today here. <laughs> um, we'll wrap it up. And we really appreciate everything that you did. If, um, people want to find out more about you, about your NDT, or about uh, the Tales of the NICU, where can they find all that? So the best place to go is to ndtpodcast.com. That can show you all things nonsense and deep thoughts. Uh, I do have an email for the NICU show if you decide that you are willing to share your story with the world to try to help somebody out. You can email talesfromthenicu at yahoo.com. And we can work out a way to tell your story, whether you want to come on and explain yourself or if you'd like to write out your story, take your time, get every detail down and send it to me. I would be more than glad to read it out for you. Very well, awesome. That's perfect. It's great to hear. We really appreciate everything, Corey, and we appreciate you sharing the story and sharing for everyone in the world. Um, all right. Well, that's the, uh, the Real Life Parenting Podcast. I'm Jeff. And I'm Jenna. And... See you later.